Hello, everyone. This is another episode of Unisoft Law YouTube show. And I have a guest today who already uh, appeared on our show and is backed by popular demand. Anna Molojevaya, a uh, tax lawyer here in Toronto. In our previous video, she talked about current developments in uh, uh, federal government's emergency measures, uh, including tax measures related to the COVID emergency. She has an update for us today specifically about uh, the SIBA program and uh, some interesting details about the SIBA program. So without further ado, I want to welcome Anna Malajavaya today. Thank you, Anna, for being here. Thank you, Polat, for having me. It's always a pleasure. I appeared twice. Uh, yes if you remember. It's absolutely correct. So uh, uh, the very first interview that I did was with you. And at that time, we did it on Instagram. We did an Instagram live chat. And we had uh, a lot of people uh, joining some people I know that someone even created an Instagram account just to see that interview. And you also talked about uh, uh, current uh, COVID related federal government emergency measures. So today I wanted to talk about the Canadian Emergency Business Account Program known as the SIBA program. We know that it uh, was established by the federal government, but it is administered by commercial banks. Can you please share the current status update on SIBA? Current status is, uh, in, is such that the application, the first, the, the import, I'll start with the important stuff first. The application deadline to apply for SIBA has been extended until October 31st, 2020. Good news. Don't delay too much. Uh, if you plan to apply, now is the time to get your documents in order, talk to your accountant, and uh, submit the application. Uh, if you've applied for the program and received your funds already, uh, we, I'm hoping to discuss how you allow to spend your funds and when you should be probably spending your funds. And uh, if you applied for the program and you're still waiting for, or you were denied, or you're still waiting for uh, some clarification, that's something also we can discuss. Understood. Very briefly, if I understand it correctly, SIBA is a program that um, finances some regular expenditures by businesses in Canada uh, when or where a, a given business was affected by COVID and its revenues uh, declined, correct? Correct. If you, uh, there is the government website that describes the program and the eligibility requirement. And if you look at the, at the preamble, uh, discussing the program in very general details, you'll see that the program was created to assist Canadian businesses with uh, non-deferrable operational expenses. Uh, during this COVID emergency. That was the goal of the program. That was the purpose that it was supposed to serve. And the, yes, there are some, um, it's not perfect, the program as it was designed, but it was designed in a very short period of time. And, uh, you know, it has been a lifetime, it has been a lifeline for many businesses, especially those who did not get any, get any assistance from their landlords. They mm -hmm. relied on SIBA to survive during the last few months. Uh, understood. So essentially the central feature of SIBA is uh, funding for um, operational expenses. So SIBA is about spending money. It's about pocket money for businesses. But are there any restrictions on how businesses are allowed to spend this pocket money uh, provided by the federal government? Yes, there are restrictions and they are spelled out in your agreement with your bank. So if you want to know how you are allowed to spend your SIBA funds, your $40,000 loan. Uh, pull up that agreement 
and uh, or talk to your lawyer, talk to your advisor, to your accountant, to find that clause that defines the allowable use of SIBA funds. Most likely, every bank uses a different SIBA agreement, and uh, but that clause should be relatively similar for all banks. And what it will say is that you're allowed to spend money on non-deferrable operational expenses. Uh, at this time, believe it or not, the government website does not provide a lot of guidance as to what those expenses are. There isn't a lot of guidance. So uh, talk to your bank advisor, or maybe they will have an answer for you. Talk to your accountant, but the answer as to what you're allowed to spend SIBA on is in your agreement with the bank. Just to break down some, <coughs> sorry, just to break down some relationships and obligations here. SIBA is administered by commercial banks. True. Uh, to uh, receive money under the SIBA program, it is necessary to enter into an agreement with your bank. So the source of, uh, of obligations for borrowers under SIBA is this agreement, a private contract with a commercial bank. Are there any, is there any relationship when one uh, takes advantage of the SIBA program between the borrower and the federal government? And if yes, what is the source of that relationship? A statute or regulation or maybe a second agreement? There isn't a second agreement. There isn't a relationship that we're aware of. So the consequence of not using SIBA appropriately would be a breach of that agreement with your bank a breach of the declaration you provided and uh, the loss of all the benefits you were entitled to. Uh, at this point, we are not aware of any instances where that breach occurred and any situations where someone really suffered the consequences. So it's hard to provide you with practical um, experience as to what's gonna happen. But if you don't follow the rules, you'll be in breach of the agreement with your bank and uh, the regular breach of contract consequences will follow. Right. So there is no word that CRA enforces anything here or any other government agency polices the SIBA program. There is nothing like that, correct? Uh, I, I don't know of any specific uh, program in place, but because the federal government guarantees these loans mm -hmm. uh, and um, I, I, I do think that the CRA will be actively involved in uh, making sure that uh, that the, the, the contracts with the banks are um, complied with. How it's going to happen we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. But essentially the government delegated this program to commercial banks and uh, its primary role is as the source of, of funding. Would that be a correct view of the situation? True. All right. Okay. So do you, do you know, do you have any information that the government had any input into those commercial agreements with the banks or if, I'm sure that the banks entered into their own agreements with the government when they joined the program, right? We, we, we can safely assume that, although I don't have any information about it, but it's very unlikely that something else happened, right? So do you have any information that the government dictated the terms that the banks need to put into those uh, agreements that SIBA um, borrowers will have to sign some terms will i'm 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 certain were dictated by the government and those terms are the amount of the loan uh the uh the fact that it's interest free uh how it should be used meaning non-deferrable uh operational expenses uh, the provision that allows for debt 
forgiveness if the loan is repaid is if 30 if um, 30,000 of the loan or 75% of the loan is repaid before December 31st 2022 uh, 25% of the loan is forgiven those are the terms that were dictated by the government as part of the program some other terms may be um, being specific and in fact we do know that some banks uh, use packages, SIBA packages, that are quite different from other banks. So RBC is a perfect example. So if, I, if you're an RBC client who received the SIBA funds from RBC, I would strongly encourage you to review your agreement and maybe talk to your bank advisor or your accountant about when you should be borrowing and spending your SIBA funds. Thank you, Anna. And I want to remind the viewers that the purpose of this video is to alert you to issues, not to give you any advice on your particular situation. It's really important to consult a professional after watching this video, uh, your own professional, if you have any questions. Um, the reason I was so interested in uh, the um, government's part in uh, drafting these, these agreements or setting up these uh, uh, commercial banks agreements with SIBA borrowers is because obviously see the SIBA program is a policy initiative and it the government has some policy goals and you listed a few provisions a few terms of, of the SIBA program or any agreement agreement with a commercial bank under the SIBA program that obviously has the flavor of, of policy goals, such as, for example, uh, um, no interest, right, or forgiveness and things like that. So I'm really curious about the provisions of these agreements that regulate spending of SIBA money. And I'm trying to uh, establish what policy objectives the government uh, had when it dictated or influenced that term. Can you speculate a little bit on that? I can only speculate. I wasn't privy to uh, development of the program. So again, the, the spirit of the program is to provide a lifeline to businesses in the emergency situation to, to provide the businesses with uh, funding when other funding may not be available during COVID. So if you're really struggling to pay your rent, to pay your utilities, to pay your insurance, these are the SIBA funds to help you survive. That, is suppo that was supposed to be the, the, the goal of the program. But as we know, there is no requirement for a business to be really financially affected to be, uh, to be eligible for SIBA. So businesses who are doing extremely well nowadays, let's say online businesses who are living the life or businesses who are selling masks or sanitizers, they're having the best year of their life. They too can be eligible for SIBA. So uh, don't ask me how, uh, whether it was really a, a, a way to save, you know, struggling businesses or whether it was just an injection into the economy and just free money for everyone so that to keep the wheels of the economy rolling. I'm not an economist, I don't know, but the fact that you don't need to be financially suffering to receive SIBA, uh, that I think is interesting in its own. Right. I, I'm, I want to dig in deeper into the allowed expenses. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I want you to explain the difference between eligible non-deferrable expenses and allowable SIBA expenses under the agreements with the commercial banks. Good question. And I take, I take it that you, you've, uh, you, you're looking at my blog post as you uh, read the definition. So this, uh, I, I, um, this post was inspired by the two extremes I see among my 
uh, clients and um, tax professionals that I work with. So the two extremes are the following. On the one extreme, I see people who spend SIBA as if it was their birthday money. They go on trips uh, using SIBA funds. They, go, they take advantage of Labor Day, uh, Labor Day sales at uh, malls. Uh, they are living the life. This is wrong, as we just discussed. That's against your contract. You're not allowed to do that. That's one extreme. And the other extreme are people who are very by the book. And before they make any purchase, before they make any purchase, they call their accountant and they say, I want to, for example, buy inventory using my SIBA funds. Am I allowed to do so? And their accountants sometimes go on SIBA website and they look for expenses, expenses, expenses. And the uh, the, the, uh, the only term that uses the word expenses on the website is eligible non-deferrable expenses. So naturally, the accountants study the definition of the term, the, which is very narrow, very restrictive, and they advise the client based on that definition. So no, inventory, the answer to my question would be then, no, you cannot use uh, SIBA to buy inventory, the accountant would say. And that is wrong. That is wrong. And this is because eligible non-deferrable expenses is a definition used for something very different entirely. Eligible non-deferrable expenses is, some, is a term used to determine whether or not you qualify for SIBA use of, using non-deferrable expenses stream. So if you received your SIBA money already, forget about eligible non-deferrable expenses. That's not relevant to you anymore. Do not look at it and do not confuse your clients. So what you should be looking at is your agreement with the bank. And your agreement with the bank will have a specific clause as to how you allow to spend your SIBA funds and uh, you know, non-deferrable operational expenses include inventory. So you are allowed to spend your SIBA on inventory. Go ahead and grow your business, develop your business. We've got to survive a tough winter. It's ahead of us. Yes, absolutely. No one knows what to expect this winter. <laughs> no. Do you know anything about uh, any extensions of the SIBA program to this winter? Uh, well, in terms of uh, extensions, um, uh, in terms of uh, the application deadline, no, I'm not aware that the application deadline will be extended. In terms of when and how SIBA funds can be used, that, that's, that again is an interesting issue that we see among friends and clients and tax professionals. Um, is the difference between different agreements. So if you are an RBC client, again, if you're an RBC client, you're special. Uh, you have to read your agreement and you have to understand what it says. And what it says in very general terms is that you get a line of credit in during your 2020 calendar year. Line of credit is something is, is $40,000 available to you to borrow. So go ahead and borrow it, right? If you don't borrow the funds from your line of credit, if your line of credit balance is, I'm making it up, you know, $20,000 or $25,000. On December 31st, 2020. That's all the SIBA funds you're gonna get if you're an RBC client. So if you didn't borrow, if you didn't withdraw those funds from your line of credit with RBC from your $40,000 available to you, on January 1st, 2021, your line of credit gets converted into a regular term loan, and that's it. No more SIBA for you. So if you only borrowed $25,000 in 2020, no more SIBA for you. You don't get to borrow any more in 2021. 
If, however, if you if you are a client of a different bank, which you probably saw is that $40,000 was deposited into your operational account. You didn't have a line of credit. You had your operational account. One day you just saw $40,000 dropped into your operational account and you get to spend it when you need it. And mm -hmm. I, I take it for the struggling businesses, the answer is obvious. They spend it right away, they need to survive. For other businesses, they may choose to defer those funds until next winter when we don't know what's gonna happen and have them available to them. Uh, but that option, like I said, will not be available to RBC clients. If RBC clients don't withdraw SIBA funds from their alliance of credits this year, that's it. They won't have those funds. And likewise, the debt forgiveness amount also is calculated based on that um, based on that balance uh, as of December 31st, 2020. So for RBC clients, if they don't withdraw the funds from line of credits, um, their, uh, forgive, uh, their forgiveness amount will be calculated as 25% of their balance as of December 31st, 2020. And, not, and, and it may be less than $10,000, whereas for all of the, the other banks, clients of uh, most other banks, it will be 25% uh, of 40,000. So they get $10,000 uh, maximum uh, debt forgiveness. So something to consider. We are now in the SIBA honeymoon period from a litigator's perspective, uh, from a commercial litigator's perspective, right? It's the time when money is flowing in and uh, the biggest issue is being qualified for this money but all honeymoons end and uh, the time will come when businesses will have to pay the money back right and for commercial litigators debt collection is an important issue and uh, there are several aspects to this issue and i want to loop back to my question about the government's role uh, in this relationship established under SIBA, the relationship between the bank and the borrower so we know that the governments uh, and i mean both the federal government and the provincial government can get all kinds of breaks in uh, in debt collection uh, both in uh, the area of bankruptcy law for example right so debts to the cra um, may survive bankruptcy or something like that uh, governments get breaks in terms of priority uh, when they register um, securities on assets and things like that right so there are different areas of commercial uh, law where government has priority or immunity or special uh, status. It's really curious that government here appears to uh, simply have to have simply handed off this program to commercial banks. And I'm curious, is there any, is there anything you can say about collecting SIBA when it's due? Um, do you have any information or maybe you can speculate about whether only commercial banks will be stuck with those debts uh, or with collecting those debts? Will they have any incentive to collect those debts if they are guaranteed by the federal government? And if the federal government is going to be the ultimate payor, then how can the federal government collect these debts if it doesn't have a relationship with the borrowers, it, it, it looks like? Good question. I thought about it uh, our, uh, myself. Uh, I, bill C-14 that was uh, enacted in April of 2020, that's the bill that provided the government with the right to guarantee um, the loans uh, provided by private banks. That was the uh, right that was used to, um, in order to administer SIBA. In terms of collecting and priority and incentives for the bank to truly try to collect when they know that somebody else guaranteed the loan, that's a very good question. I don't know the answer to it. What I do know is that 
from speaking um, uh, to my bankruptcy colleagues, they have seen already bankruptcies. Already we see bankruptcies uh, where people defaulted after receiving uh, SIBA loans. So it, 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 if it's a problem in the summer of 2020, mm -hmm. I, I do think it'll be an even bigger problem in the summer of 2021, 2022. Um, I don't know what right. to say. Yes, my guess would be that uh, the government inserted some kind of um, collection or enforcement clauses in its agreements with commercial banks where commercial banks undertook to uh, collect those debts. And uh, my theory why the government delegated everything to commercial banks in the first place, I guess it's similar to why insurance companies delegate selling insurance to insurance brokers, right? They already have the network of agents and branches and the government doesn't want to um, to deal with the small potatoes right of processing applications and it's pretty expensive and banks probably are equipped to do it well so i'm curious about the compensation arrangement that banks have with the government and uh, it's it will be really interesting to see those agreements between the banks and the government but also everybody should check that that uh, legislation bill what which one is it bill c14 april we'll 12 uh, yeah. 2020 yeah I, I, I there must be something there in that legislation also uh, uh no I, no nothing. there is no so there it, is. it was and a purely I, I fiscal curious to see those agreements between the government and the bank i was not privy to those right so that bill uh, that legislation was a purely fiscal measure that simply uh allocated the money to the government and authorized the government to uh, start this program right it was just the authorization no no allocation of money it was remember april 2020 it was an emergency situation everyone was in shock uh, and uh, mm -hmm. to to add to your point about why the cra the government needed help in administering these programs is because they have they are administering the the uh, wage subsidy program which is a huge program and right. they're added there they're doing a very good job uh, at it from what i hear it's well set up it's well administered uh, so and to to add to your point they just thought that it wasn't practic practicable for them to add siba and sikra to their workload at in april of 2020 when uh, their cra employees were at home like the rest of us and uh, yeah. they were struggling to come up with something urgently because bills had to be paid right away right mm -hmm. so we, we didn't have time to do, to design something perfect right well this was a very interesting update you know i'm sure some of our viewers also want to know more about you and your practice uh, you, uh, this is the third time you spoke to our viewers and every time you spoke, uh, it was uh, on some very technical topic, uh, yet very interesting topic. How about, uh, sharing a little bit about yourself and telling us about, about your practice, Anna? Uh, I am the founder and the owner of Advo Tax Law. It's a tax law firm in West Toronto. Uh, our office is next to Sherway Gardens Mall. If you were ever at the mall, stop by for coffee. Uh, we help people with any kinds of tax problems, tax planning, which is becoming very interesting nowadays with all the fluctuations we, we see on the market and also tax litigation. Any uh, issues you have with the decision the CRA made on your behalf will be happy to review it for you and help you dispute it if it was wrong. Um, so anything tax. I know that you're a senior lawyer, right? So I also wanted, I wanted to hear a little bit, you're more senior than me. And uh, I wanted to hear a little bit about your, um, uh, your, your path and the things you did and uh, 
uh, where you came from uh, on Bay Street and uh, where you were trained, uh, the law school, uh, if you can, like uh, a short recap of your career path. That would be fantastic. Um, my first law degree for, is from Belarus, Belarusian State University, Minsk. Um, and then I came to Canada in 2004, where I, where I liked doing my law degree so much. I did another law degree, this time at Osgoode, at your law school, Vlad. I uh, graduated in 2007 and uh, then some, spent some time, um, seven years, on Bay Street at their tax and trust group, doing some really interesting, exciting, high profile, um, you know, deals on the front page of newspapers type of deals. When you say uh, there, you, you mean castles, right? Castles. <laughs> yes, castles, because... Yeah. I don't think the viewers heard that. Okay, so Castles Brook um, uh, was trained by, I think, one of the most brilliant tax lawyers in the country. And uh, after, after Castles, I worked for another firm, a tax boutique firm in downtown Toronto for five years. And then I started my own practice, which is a 10 minutes drive from my house and uh, loving it so far. That's great. It's uh, fantastic to know you and to consider myself your friend and colleague. I'm really thankful for this uh, opportunity to speak with you every once in a while and to learn so much from you, Anna. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your time with us, uh, with me and our viewers today. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure.